I think we can get get started. All of our speakers, and uh, I think most folks are are settled. And there's uh, there's more scattered seats up here, including in the front row, if if anybody in the back needs one. Um, so, welcome to New America. Uh, I am Michael Calabrese, director of the Wireless Future Project here, which is part of our Open Technology Institute. Uh, our topic, of course, is the next generation TV transition. Can the FCC protect consumers and promote innovation? So yes, you may have thought we just went through a DTV transition fairly recently, but we're, we're doing it again. Um, and um, it was eight years ago that we completed uh, the last uh, analog to DTV transition which was a fairly, fairly uh, prolonged uh, but successful process, I think, in, in retrospect. Um, and so uh, next, uh, next week, Thursday, the FCC is scheduled to vote on rules to authorize a transition to next-gen TV, which is a, a new standard. You hear the term ATSC 3.0, which will replace 1.0. I didn't notice 2.0 go by, but I, I think they skipped over that one. Um, uh, the proposed order would authorize uh, what they're calling a voluntary and market-driven transition that would not immediately force consumers to buy a new TV. Still, I, I think as you'll hear today, um, some contentious issues remain, including some that may, you know, that are still in play in terms of any changes to the order, uh, concerning whether, well, really not whether, but how many viewers will lose access to their, local ch to their local channels over the air, and whether pay TV providers or consumers will ultimately bear other costs related to the transition. At its November meeting, the FCC will also vote on an order that would drastically roll back media ownership limits on consolidation in the broadcasting sector. And I don't know how much we may get into that a little bit, but um, we're really probably focused primarily here on the next-gen TV transition, which is a big enough issue in and of itself. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel in a second, and then that she'll be followed by uh, a panel um, representing various stakeholders that are impacted uh, by the transition. Um, just, just to set, set the record, uh, clear or straight, we, we did invite uh, broadcasters, uh, the National Association of Broadcasters, uh, most specifically, and we thought they had accepted, but then um, de declined to participate. So, so and, <laughs> and Mike Gravino is here from, from the low power television side, and we'll hope to, uh, yeah, and we'll hope to hear some questions and comments in, uh, in the audience discussion part, which reminds me that when that comes around, please do tell us, uh, you know, who you uh, who you are, who you represent. That'll probably, you know, help help uh, everyone. We'll have a microphone uh, to to uh, go around. But um, I know uh, the commissioner is is really slammed today because it's uh, as darkness falls, sunshine dawns uh, on our one week quiet period uh, before the meeting next week. So she has meetings. Uh, just uh, all the rest of the day squeezed in. Um, so this is uh, really uh, uh, for Commissioner Rosenworcel, her welcome back <laughs> appearance. <laughs> welcome back to the FCC appearance here at New America, and we hope uh, one of uh, many to come over the next uh, five years. Of course, um, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel um, has already served one complete term uh, in the FCC that ended in January. And after a, a brief vacation <laughs> and tortuous uncertainty, uh, thankfully, was uh, reconfirmed uh, by the Senate, appointed by President Trump, no less, uh, to uh, serve another uh, five-year term. Um, and she has some, uh, quite a lot of very direct experience uh, with DTV transitions, um, having been uh, the, um, the uh, the senior counsel uh, to the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee at the time of the last uh, transition, 
and also, you know, served um, and also has experience being in the minority at the FCC, learned some valuable lessons as senior advisor to uh, Michael Copps uh, prior to that. Um, and then I, I can't help mentioning, um, although it's not directly related, that we are always very thankful we have uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel as uh, the champion for, uh, for unlicensed spectrum and for progressive wireless broadband policy in, in general because she's uh, one of the few in government who really get it, who really looks, looks forward to see how the wireless ecosystem uh, is evolving and is not the same as it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And so we really rely on her for, for those issues um, as much as we do for this one. So, Commissioner. All right, thank you, Michael. Thank you to OTI and New America for having me here this afternoon. And uh, so let's talk about next generation television. But to get started, I'm not going to talk about television at all. I'm going to talk about something more old fashioned. I'm going to talk about a book. So earlier this year, Thomas Friedman published Thank You for Being Late. And in it, he makes the case that 2007 was the year that technology took over. His evidence is pretty good. After all, it was in 2007 that we were first introduced to the iPhone, to Android, and to Kindle. It was the year that IBM started Watson, bringing cognitive computing into popular culture, and Hadoop launched, helping usher in the era of big data. It was also the year that software began, as the founder of Netscape once said, to eat the world. So if we look back, on 2007, a decade ago, we see a clear inflection point in history. But I'm going to argue now that two years earlier, in 2005, well, that deserves a second look. 2005 may not have been a hinge moment for technological change, but I think it made its mark because it gave us an early glimpse of some forces that would come to define the future. So YouTube began in 2005, bringing with it the then novel concept of user-generated content. And right now, of course, that's just what we create and what we watch. Gaming got a boost in 2005 with the introduction of the Xbox 360. And today, interactive gaming is a $109 billion industry worldwide. That is bigger than the gross domestic product of Latvia and Luxembourg combined. Also in 2005, Stephen Colbert coined the term truthiness. And I think it's fair to say that that has some relevance in our discourse now, but I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> One more point. In 2005, it's when Congress passed the Digital Television Transition and Public Safety Act. You may not remember it, but this law set up the future of television. The Digital Television and Public Safety Act laid out a framework for the transition from analog to digital broadcasting. But it did more than introduce a new standard with improved sound and picture quality, what we call ATSC 1.0. It created a schedule. As part of the schedule, it featured an end date for a nationwide transition. In addition, it put in place a program to help ensure that viewers could make sure that their existing television sets would continue to work after this technology change. In other words, Congress took the lead, and this law laid out the path. Now, in response, the FCC took its cues from Congress. The agency made a series of policy choices under this law, including the auction of spectrum recovered from analog service. Then it decided to do something really smart. It decided to test the transition itself. The agency selected Wilmington, North Carolina as a test market. It worked with community leaders, broadcasters, cable and satellite providers to ensure its residents were ready to go 
a full nine months before the deadline in the law. And there were plenty of public service announcements and town hall meetings. There were also more FCC visits to coastal Carolina to, than you or I could count. But the end result was good and helpful because the agency was able to work with local officials, review what happened, and then use what happened to inform its efforts going forward. Next, the FCC took the lessons it learned from Wilmington and did a test statewide. As a result, Hawaii, the last state to join the union, became the first state to fully transition to digital television. Again, the FCC took notes and learned from the experience to help facilitate the nationwide rollout. So, if you look back now at what was put in place in 2005, it clearly laid the groundwork for the future of television. There were adjustments made along the way, but what stands out are three fundamental things. First, the transition was a backing, was an effort with the full backing of Congress. Second, it featured a program to prevent viewers from bearing the full cost of losing service on their existing television sets. And third, the FCC explored the transition in test markets before unleashing the change nationwide. Consequently, up and down the television ecosystem, stations, distributors, and manufacturers were prepared. Moreover, and more critically, Consumers were not saddled with big bills for new television sets or new equipment. Like I said at the start, we could learn a lot from 2005. Of course, that was then, and this is now. Next week, the agency plans to vote on an order clearing the way for next generation television. This means the agency is set to vote on the introduction of ATSC 3.0. In other words, we are set to change the television standard again. To be clear, there is a lot to be excited about with this new standard. Ultra high definition picture quality, an immersive audio, advanced emergency alerts, and interactive new innovative services. That's good stuff. It could mean real innovation for broadcasting on par with new services that have already emerged on so many of the screens all around us. But I think the agency is about to rush this standard to market with an ugly disregard for the consequences for consumers. The FCC has released its draft decision proposing the changeover, and as you might expect, it's riddled with the wonkish language of standards and lawyerly details of licensing. So it's right up my alley and maybe yours. But if you stand back and you take a look, a clear-eyed look, you get a feel for what it really means for consumers. If you do, here's what you'll see. This new standard may be glorious, but it is not backwards compatible with current television devices. That means every one of us will need to replace existing television sets or buy new equipment. The FCC calls this approach market-driven. That's true because we will all be forced into the market for new television sets and devices. To be clear, this isn't going to happen immediately because for the time being, the FCC calls the new standard voluntary. While it's voluntary, however, stations will have the right to negotiate with cable and satellite companies for simultaneous carriage of ATSC 1.0 and ATSC 3.0. That means consumers could find their bills going up because they will be stuck paying for two signals even though their current television sets and devices can only receive one. That sounds like paying more and getting less. I think the way that the FCC plans to proceed right now is no great boon for consumers I think it's a tax on every household with a television. It's time for the agency to go back to the drawing board and find a less disruptive way to facilitate broadcast innovation. I think there's a way to do it. 
And I think it's right there in the 2005 playbook. Because what's missing here are those three critical features of the approach from 2005. First, there is no congressional mandate. What we have instead is a few unelected FCC officials making decisions about when you need to buy new televisions, acquire new equipment, and locate the HDMI port on the back of your set. Second, there is no program to defray the cost of new devices, equipment, or television sets that consumers will need to purchase. Third, there's no test market or sandbox to experiment or understand our policies before unleashing them nationwide. So where do we go next? I think the responsible thing for the agency to do is to work with Congress to set a new framework in the law. I also think we need to find a way to reduce the costs this transition clearly imposes on consumers. But because innovation should proceed in the interim, I think the FCC should immediately find a new Wilmington. In other words, it's time to test the ATSC 3.0 experience in a single market and commit to learning from the experience before giving the green light for a rollout nationwide. If we do this, there will be plenty to study because there are still big questions about this new standard. For starters, I think we better, need to better understand those consumers who are most at risk of being left behind. I also think we need to better understand targeted advertising on televisions and the implications for consumer privacy. We need to better understand the use of encrypted signals, the collection of audience data, and the susceptibility to hacking and malware. In addition, the FCC needs to better understand the patent issues involved. When the agency adopted the ATSC 1.0 standard, it made clear that reasonable and non-discriminatory terms were part of the package. In the current proposal, this issue is addressed in no more than a footnote. Moreover, we know that Sinclair Broadcasting, which holds key essential patents for ATSC 3.0, has been one of the biggest champions of this new standard. We also know they have pending before the agency the biggest broadcasting transaction in our nation's history. Before we authorize billions for patent holders and saddle consumers with the bills, we better understand how these rights holders will not take advantage of the special status conferred upon them by the FCC. And thank you for being late. Thomas Friedman writes about more than just what happened in 2007. He writes about the pace at which we adopt to change. He makes the point that technological change is coming at all of us faster than ever before. I'm sure everyone here would agree. And I think like everyone else, broadcasting can and should be part of this innovative rush. But I think what the FCC has before it now is imprecise and cavalier in its disregard for consumers. I believe the transition should leave no viewer worse off and leave us all better off. I think that kind of future is possible for next generation television, but we're going to have to take a cue from 2005 if we want to get there in a way that works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. That was uh, an excellent history lesson, among other things, and it nicely sets up our panel, which who all should come up right now so that we can keep rolling forward. So what I'll, I think what I'll do is to, uh, to spare the audience uh, a string of talking heads. Let, um, how about if I, I think I'll I introduce uh, you folks you know, one at a time and, and give you a chance to, um, uh, 
to sort of tee up uh, a few of your main points, um, or at least, the, at least based on what I have in mind uh, f for you. So let, let's start with, uh, with John Schwantes, who's the Senior Policy Counsel for Consumers Union here in their uh, D.C. office, and John also was eight years for, uh, working for the, the antitrust uh, uh, subcommittee on Senate Judiciary, um, so has Lots of experience, uh, and and actually, I won't give uh, long form bios for anyone since you all have the hopefully have the bio handout. Um, so, John, the the broadcast industry maintains that the next gen TV transition is is voluntary. Uh, will it be truly voluntary, and um, does it impact different categories of consumers, such as over the air and pay TV subscribers, uh, differently? Great, thank you, Michael. Thanks for, ha thanks for having me here today. Um, in preparing for today's panel, I was reminded of an experience I had early in my career on the Hill. Um, I was in the Senate. We were negotiating a, the Satellite Home Viewer Act, which I think some of the folks here in the room and on the panel know all about. And it was very contentious. There were potentials for consumers to lose their television signals. And I remember during the debate and the negotiations, the senator took me aside and said, you would think, Jonathan, that America, he was joking, American consumers have a constitutional right to TV. And of course, that's a joke, but it underscores how important these issues are to consumers. And when the government or a regulatory agency tinkers with their ability to receive TV, they get pretty fired up. Um, to your question, Michael, and I agree with much of what Commissioner Rosenworcel laid out in her, in her keynote, but um, I like to think a bit about three different classes of consumers. And I'll take the easy one first. Sort of the high-end, early adopter consumer. They know all about this standard. They're, they're excited. They want the 4K signal, high dynamic resolution, wide gamut color, all the wonky things. They're ready. They just can't wait to buy the new TV. So that's voluntary for them. They just have to wait for the broadcast just to actually deliver that content over the air, which maybe a year, maybe a two, we'll see, because it's voluntary for the broadcasters as well. Let's move to the harder category, over the air. It's anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the American uh, consumers. We say 17 percent in our comments. The point is, is a significant portion of, of folks still receive their television signals over the air. Whether they're cord cutters or whether they're just plain frugal, that's how they receive their TV signals. And the way you, you, you parse through the devils in the details in the order, there's a real chance as this transition moves forward and how it works, it involves moving that channel, that current signal, the 1.0 signal, to another station within the local market. But when that happens, some people could lose their signal. We can get into the details of that today. Another problem with those over-the-air consumers is as broadcasters may have to degrade the current high-definition signal to standard definition. So I think that's not voluntary at all. You're not volunteering to lose your over-the-air signal, and you're not volunteering for a nostalgic experience to watch TV from 30 years ago. And finally is the, the rest of us who get our local broadcast channels through a pay TV provider. Um, Ross and Mike can probably speak more to these issues in detail, but, and the commissioner pointed it out, if broadcasters, there's a real chance they could squeeze these t pay TV providers to carry the 3.0 signal. And that's irrespective of whether the consumers have the ability to even see the signal, or even if the cable company is able to transmit the signal. But we at Consumers Union see that those consumers ultimately, or the, excuse me, those costs ultimately get passed on to consumers. And again, that would not be voluntary. But we can get into it. Thanks, Michael. Okay, thanks, John. Um, next, we'll go to the, to the middle here and hear about consumers from a different angle, uh, Ross. Marchand is the, is, um, the uh, director of policy for the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, uh, based here in D.C. as well. And um, Ross, I guess I'd like to ask you, how, how does Next Gen TV and the proposed transition to this ATSC 3.0 standard, how do you see it impacting uh, taxpayers? Well, I would say that, first of all, <coughs> The majority of the analysis about these standards uh, deal exclusively with the impact on consumers and households. And I think that that's definitely a um, very important angle to look at, but something that's being 
neglected is the impact on taxpayers across the country at all levels of government, federal costs, state costs, and local costs. There was a report that came out recently by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and they said that there's a shortfall of around $145 million that public broadcasters like PBS and locally provided television stations across the country are going to face in terms of transition and implementation um, of these ATSC standards. And I think it's important to note when you're talking about these public costs, they're not evenly distributed. The most cash-strapped localities and municipalities are going to have to bear the brunt <coughs> of these transition costs. And I think that ultimately that's going to have to be borne by taxpayers in these very poor areas. I'm thinking especially of Guam. PBS Guam reported recently that they would face millions of dollars in transition costs um, and massive implementation hurdles <coughs> in order to um, bring ATSC uh, to their airwaves. And Guam is one of the poorest areas of the country. So when you're talking about the cost of bringing those ATSC standards to Guam, you're facing really um, grave trade-offs in terms of healthcare and education expenditures. And that's not to mention all of the, um, the rural locally provided stations across the country that just uh, transitioned to DTV in the late 2000s and they were promised. Can I just help you with this conversation? Uh, Mike, let's, let's finish. <laughs> okay, we're gonna really All right, thanks. But I'll, I'll definitely give you a chance when we get to the, <laughs> to the audience. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. But <laughs> um, so the DTV uh, transition, I mean, you had these locally provided stations across the country doling out all these expenditures for this transmitter equipment. And the problem is life expectancy of this equipment was something like 20 years. And now eight years later, they have to dole out additional expenditures to finance this transition. And I think that the second major cost category for taxpayers is in terms of all the TV equipment owned by local governments across the country. I mean, you're thinking the average uh, school has something like 10 to 15 television sets, and that's not to mention community centers, uh, even DMV, um, and all sorts of transportation centers across the country that own television equipment, and they're going to have to bear the brunt um, of, that, of those upgrade costs. And I think that before we move forward with this transition, it's important to have a report detailing the cost to taxpayers. I agree that the DTV uh, transition a few years ago provides a very good model um, for this transition, and we should follow the footsteps that Congress took in 2005 in uh, setting the stage for DTV. Um, and even with that transition, there were still some issues in terms of last minute education and outreach that had to be doled out to consumers and local governments that were still unprepared on the eve of that transition. And I think that even the best laid plans will have to run into those uh, costs. And those costs, um, in terms of last minute education and outreach, will inevitably be borne by federal taxpayers. So I think that we cannot walk into the situation blindfolded, and we need to have an adequate accounting of the cost that will be borne by federal, state, and local taxpayers in seeing through this ATSC transition. All right. Thanks, Ross. Um, like, so now I'd like to bring in uh, Joe Canfield, who is uh, Vice President and Assistant General Counsel of NTCA, the Wireless Broadband Association. NTCA represents 850 small and rural telecom providers, and although we're usually uh, working with them on, on, on wireless uh, competition issues, um, they obviously have a, a stake in this too. So, um, Jill, um, you know, NTCA is, you know, obviously is, is focused on, uh, you know, on, on rural telecom uh, provision and not, uh, not, you know, not video per se, but so why is this issue important to your members? How do they come in? Hey, thank you, Michael. Um, first, I do want to correct you. Uh, we are, we have many wireless members, but we're actually the Rural Broadband Association. 
All of our members are wired uh, companies. Um, we represent uh, more than 850 uh, small rural telcos. All of them are small businesses. All of them provide service to rural areas. Um, the average density of our members' territory is seven subscribers per square mile. It's very rural. All of our members provide broadband service and probably um, 80 to 90 percent offer some sort of video product also. Uh, and they offer video for two reasons. One of them is that with video comes broadband, both deployment and adoption. Um, they're, they're, they're linked together. When you offer a video service through an IPTV, you're automatically bringing broadband to the home and it drives that broadband uh, adoption and that broadband deployment. So that's one reason. The other reason is that um, our members are community-based and community-focused. And what we found is that uh, at least a quarter of our members report that 90% of, um, 90 or more of the service territory or the subscribers in the service territory cannot receive an over-the-air broadcast signal. They cannot receive broadcast television through broadcast means. So uh, they the, the telco offers the video service so that the, uh, the subscribers have access to local news, weather, sports, etc. Now, of course, some can receive a, a signal uh, through satellite, but if you look at where our members are, uh, mountainous areas, uh, very heavily treed, that satellite is, for a lot of the rural areas, not the best option. So they rely on the MVPD. So, those are the two reasons our members are there. But you notice one of the reasons I did not say is that they're making money on this service. They are not making money on providing video service. In fact, it's a loss leader for our small businesses. There just are not enough subscribers uh, there to, to drive the profits. Um, so, like I said, they're, they're doing it for the broadband and they're doing it as a community service. And one of the reasons, though, that it is not a profitable biz business for them is uh, the cost of content. Consistently, that is the, the thing we hear from our members that is driving them out of business. Uh, we've had some members drop their video product recently. We have many, many more that are right on that edge. And that edge, uh, the thing that's going to push them over the edge is the cost. Um, their subscribers cannot afford to pay more for video service, and they cannot afford to give it uh, for any, uh, any less, right? So um, when we're talking about this transition, it's going to increase costs for our members. Uh, you're talking about new equipment. Um, you're talking about um, potentially carrying more than one signal, both the 1.0 and 3.0. Now, the, the draft order talks about a purely voluntary transition to 3.0. But our members' experience in negotiating with broadcasters, there is nothing voluntary about it. The broadcaster dictates the terms of all of the uh, agreements. It's take it or leave it, this is what you're offering. You've got 250 subs, I don't care if you drop my signal, it's not going to matter to me. Um, so our members are, are given these agreements, they have to sign them if they're going to provide any product and um, they're paying for each signal that they're carrying and if they're increasing their cost by adding new equipment to upgrade as well, the cost just becomes unbearable. Uh, we're going to see more and more members uh, drop offering video service to these areas. Yeah, thanks Joe. That's it's interesting, I didn't even realize, <laughs> realize it's sort of a take it or leave it proposition on the, you know, on the uh, content. Okay, um, so now moving to um, uh, Michael Nielsen, who is um, uh, counsel to the American Television Associate Alliance, American Television Alliance, ATBA, and a partner in the law firm of Harris, Wilshire, and Granis. And, uh, Mike, I, you know, I, I know you're also concerned about the impact on pay TV, but let me ask you first, uh, what are the biggest concerns about the draft from the over-the-air viewer's perspective? So thanks again, and thanks for having me. Uh, let me just talk a, in a little bit more detail about the simulcast, because the simulcast was really the key to the original proposal for all this in terms of protecting viewers, because again, we all, as a uh, Commissioner Rosen Russell pointed out that the, the new standard is not backwards compatible and so your existing equipment won't get it. So how are we going to protect people who don't have new equipment? We were going to simulcast, namely a station will uh, enter into an arrangement with some other station in the market to transmit the current standard from the other stations 
lighthouse facilities. A and so if this is going to really work, you know, everybody or just about everybody needs to get the simulcast. Um, the simulcast needs to be in HD, if the original signal is in HD. Um, uh, the simulcast uh, needs to be the same programming. Um, uh, and, um, and so the, the real question now with the draft order is sort of are, are all of these things happening, right? And, and so let's just take them in order. Uh, does, everybody, uh, does everybody actually get the simulcast? Uh, well, one thing that the draft order seems to say is that low power television stations who are not class A stations uh, don't have to simulcast. Uh, they can keep forgetting the phrase, it's a, flash cut. It's, I'm not allowed to say flash cut anymore, that's not in the draft, it's, it's, a, it's direct, some, directly transition, thank you, right, so, um, and the draft order acknowledges, I believe the number is that there are 42 uh, low power affiliates of the big four networks, there are additional affiliates of Univision and Telemundo and religious broadcasters, and Again, <laughs> if you think that simulcasting is important generally, you probably think that simulcasting is important for those kinds of stations. Uh, then the question is, is where does the simulcast signal reach, right? Uh, is the simulcast signal, uh, uh, you know, because again, if you can get your signal today, but you can't get the simulcast signal, uh, uh, that is problematic. And the draft order has some standards about where the, 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 the simulcast signal ought to be located. And the point of contention now seems to be the question of who gets expedited processing. And, and the draft says you should get expedited processing uh, if you lose up to 5% of your population coverage with your simulcast. And is that the right number? And, and, and what should expedited processing kind of look like? Um, so those are the two questions about who gets it. Um, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the format, uh, the draft says that there are no requirements if you transmit today in high def, uh, you get to transmit tomorrow in standard def, or, or you get to otherwise degrade the picture. And, and again, we think that if you are used to watching the football game in high def, uh, you are not going to be happy if, if tomorrow or next week or next year uh, you get standard def. And so that remains a, 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 an issue to be discussed. And then the final issue is, is it the same programming? And, and here I think that the, the task for the commission was, how do you make, how do you have a simulcast rule that, that, that both permits the innovation if you have interactive programming that literally can't be transmitted in the 1.0, uh, but, but you avoid the circumstances where the football game is on the new signal and, and the home shopping channel is on the old signal. Um, and the FCC has a draft standard but proposes that the, 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 this standard, the, the substantial similarity standard, disappear in five years. And, and so the question is, is, should it disappear while simulcasting is, is still a requirement? Uh, and if it should, is, is five years the right number or not? So, so that's sort of the lay of the land in terms of simulcasting, at least as, as, as we see it. All right. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, yeah, and I definitely want to come back during the discussion to the uh, simulcasting because although it was certainly a relief uh, for, I think, the the consumer advocates, at least, that there is a simulcasting requirement, <laughs> you know, that, that, that there's not just a blank check for a flash cut permanent transition. Um, some of these, what you might call loopholes in terms of whether it's actually the same content and, um, and the signal quality, you know, are, 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 are things that are probably are most in play right now uh, at the commission. But I want to make sure we introduce uh, First, Ross Lieberman, who is uh, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the American Cable Association, which represents the interests of small and medium-sized uh, cable companies. So Ross, um, what are the biggest concerns about the draft from the small cable system operator's perspective? Sure. Thanks. It's good, nice to be here. So maybe I'll just start by saying, um, look, cable operators really have no problem with the broadcasters transitioning to ATSC 3.0. If they want to make investments, take their own private capital to improve their service and offer that to consumers, over-the-air customers, that's okay. It doesn't, doesn't impact cable operators uh, directly, that aspect of it. And broadcasters are not even saying that we're all going to do it. They get the choice. 
One broadcaster can voluntarily choose to move to ATSC and make that investment, and another broadcaster can say, I'm not interested, I don't think this is gonna be popular, and I'm gonna wait for it to fail. It's strictly voluntary. It's not the case when it comes to cable operators, because if a broadcaster is going to move to 3.0, they are going to want cable operators to carry that signal. They're gonna to wanna to maximize their uh, investment. And the facts are the mechanism in which they're going to do that is through the retransmission consent process. And I'm not sure, but looking around this crowd, I'm sure everybody is familiar with retransmission consent, uh, but maybe not all the gruesome details of what actually is occurring in those agreements, not only between the broadcasters and uh, large MBPBs, but between broadcasters and very small cable operators who represent my membership. Half of my members have 1,000 subscribers or less, and they're put in a position to negotiate for retransmission consent for a valuable asset, which is the broadcast station. And so they have every reason to believe that broadcasters are going to, in those negotiations, force carriage. And why do they think that? Well, they look at how negotiations go on today. In the, in, since 2010, retransmission consent rates have increased 6,483%. Year over year over year over year, the broadcasters say, this is what you're going to pay, and if you don't pay it, we're going to withhold the signal. And they're able to get it. Uh, the, the signal is uh, um, considered must-have. They have a local monopoly in their marketplace to be able to offer it, and, and, and cable operators have no choice uh, but to do it. But it's not only about just being able to raise rates, because they can raise rates, but they also force carriage. And, and they force carriage, uh, you know, stations like ESPN, owned by ABC, USA Network, owned by NBC, FX station, owned by Fox, these all have been made available on cable networks by the leverage of retransmission consent. And when we look at ATSC 3.0, we say this is just going to be another uh, station that they force carriage. And it's even more recently Sinclair forces carriage of the tennis channel. The, the, the increased distribution is directly attributable to the fact that they want it to be carried and they use the retransmission consent process um, to do it. Um, and when they don't do it, they black out stations. And just this year alone, there's been 179 blackouts uh, across the country um, to do so. But, so with regards to ATSC, it, the question is, okay, well, that's great theory, but is it actually happening in the marketplace? And I can tell you the answer is yes. In every single one of the negotiations that my members are facing, there is a discussion of carriage of 3.0. And there's been examples already of my members having to uh, be forced into carrying the station. I think the broadcasters are a little bit cautious, a little bit cautious while the rulemaking is proceeding because uh, you know, they know that if they're kind of too aggressive, what's gonna happen is the FCC is gonna turn around and try to stop them from forcing it. But what we fully expect based on past history, based on recent current existence, they're going to force carriage of this 3.0 signal. And for my members, Hey, there's costs that are involved, and we, we heard some of them. There's a cost to receive it. There's a cost to transmit it. Uh, there's the opportunity cost. They have limited bandwidth. So in order to carry the ATSC signal, which is twice as much bandwidth to carry an HD signal, uh, they have to either use bandwidth that they otherwise would use to offer higher speeds in their communities or drop existing channels. So these are a real costs. And for a business model, that's really untested. How many people, you know, we, they go out to their customers and say, how many care about ATSC 3.0? People don't even know what it is. And so they're a little, they, they feel like they're going to be incurring all these costs uh, um, and, and not be able to, you know, on, on this, on this um, uh, something that the broadcasters believe to be, to be beneficial. So, um, you know, that, that's our concern. Uh, in addition to the simulcasting concerns that, that we've heard um, as well. All right. Thanks, Ross. Um, so I have some questions to try to, you know, bring everybody into a, to a discussion here, and then we can open it to the audience as well. So uh, first off, um, I mean, some of, um, some of what you're saying may be surprising to, to some, some of the audience because, you know, the, I think broadcasters have been saying that there's no need for the FCC 
to adopt rules to protect consumers because the broadcasters have strong incentives not to harm their viewers. Um, so this should take care of itself. They have, you know, market-based incentives to make sure this all goes really smoothly for everybody. Um, is that true, or is there any <laughs> any reason that there might be a few exceptions to that idea? Well, look, you know, uh, I assume that broadcasters uh, try to maximize profits, just like other economic actors, right? And and. And so if, if they could maximize profits by, uh, uh, by doing things that may not be in the best interests of all of their viewers, I, uh, I think that they will have incentives to do so. So, so what might some of those incentives be? Um, some of those incentives might involve, if you're able to get um, and, and, and force cable and satellite carriage of the ATSC 3.0 systems, uh, uh, you might make some decisions and be willing to leave behind the off-air folks. Um, uh, if you have some part of your ATSC 3.0 business, perhaps part of that business that is not broadcast related, that is profitable, that, that requires you to be an ATSC 3.0, you may, that may weigh against your other incentives to, uh, to fully serve all of your customers. Uh, if you have patents in the new standard and you don't have patents in the old standard, that may also weigh, you know, and, and I think, you know, frankly, uh, it is the broadcasters who have advocated very fiercely for rules that would allow them to not serve their viewers, you know, and, and so, so, you know, I, I sort of, you know, we have proposed some rules that, that we think are, would, would, would protect viewers, and the broadcasters have objected to those rules with, with, with some force, and so that suggests to me uh, where some of the incentives may lie. Mm -hmm. So, one of the Rosses or anyone have anything to add? Or I, is that I, I just agree. You know, I mean, they they they, they, um, they talk a lot about making sure that all consumers end up being able to receive service and and, and the important news and weather that they provide. But there's plenty of ex examples of them just not actually you know living up to their to their words. I mean. We've had examples of retransmission consent blackouts during emergency uh, weather situations. And you'd, so, so uh, that's of concern. For, for my members who often live at the edge, probably the 5% that might be affected by a simulcast having to move from the current location to another, broadcasters don't really care if the carriage, continued carriage on the cable operator of 1,000 subscribers. The amount of money that they make from that small cable operator is peanuts compared with the total market, the entire marketplace. And in terms of advertising, the car dealership is pretty far away from where the rural customers are residing. And so the advertising rates that they get for those kind of customers, it, it, it's not really the same. Um, and so if it's not carried, it doesn't even impact their advertising rates. So um, I think if they can figure out that there's a better business opportunity to reuse the spectrum for some other purpose, whether or not they lease it out to some other use or or they, they offer some new service on it, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, would, would abandon uh, some of the commitments that, that, mm -hmm. that the public has come to rest upon the broadcasters uh, doing. Well, that's a good, what you mentioned, you know, reminds me that not everyone, maybe everyone in this audience, but perhaps not on our webcast, uh, since we can't see them right now, but um, you know, may not know exactly what what ATSC 3.0 services are. So I think, you know, we all have, because we lived through it, we have in our minds, you know, what happened eight years ago, and it really was just strictly about the quality of the signal. We went from an analog, which was a little, you know, fuzzy often, to uh, a DTV signal, which is crisp, um, and HD uh, most of the time. But is that all ATSC 3.0 is? Is it just a question of going from an, an HD to a 4K or an 8K resolution? Or are there, are there other commercial aspects um, you know, to, you know, to what they'll do with, with 3.0 that, uh, because that, you know, and maybe as part of it, it would be helpful to explain the channel sharing, because in fact, we're now having a, um, you know, <clears throat> at least one of the channels, you know, when stations get together, at least one of the channels dedicated to this new, um, 
this new uh, standard even during the simulcast uh, transition, right? Sure, I mean, I, I could take a crack at it. I mean, it is more than just a crystal picture, but just keep in mind, there's nothing in the draft order saying the broadcasters have to do any of this in the 3.0. They don't necessarily have to broadcast a higher resolution signal, and you can get into the, the, wonky, the wonkiness of that. But um, if you believe the broadcasters, and let's say on first base value, what do you have with this new signal? You have the ability to transmit an over-in-the-air signal, in theory, to a mobile device. That could be really cool. Um, it also has the ability, because it has an IP internet protocol backbone, it's a two-way data stream. So the broadcasters get excited about targeted advertising. Well, in our comments, we say that could be great, but what about the privacy implications of that? Now, if Sinclair or another broadcaster knows everything I'm viewing, what about Ross? They're, they have Section 631 of the Communications Act. They have to protect that data, make sure it's secure. We don't need to get into data breaches today. But that's another question 3.0 raises. But yeah, there are a lot of great things from a consumer's perspective, if it works, that 3.0 could provide. But remember, the broadcasters are under no obligation to even offer any of those services. So we can come back to the privacy a little later, but what you're suggesting, for example, this idea of, of broadcasting to mobile devices, which, you know, personally I actually think that's, that's a pretty cool thing, and, and I think iPhones are capable now, but, you know, the mobile carriers have kind of insisted that that, be turned, that capability be turned off. Uh, but on the other hand, this isn't necessarily a free TV service, is it? I mean, won't these be, in some cases, the streaming, streaming a video to mobile devices uh, could be a subscription or pay for pay-per-view service as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, the broadcasters use like this amount of spectrum today to offer largely a, a primary signal and a few other multicast signals. The ATSC 3.0. Uh, technology and the compression will allow them to use this much for broadcasting, leaving this much left for any other uses that the broadcasters really want. And, 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 and the broadcasters are excited about these other uses and the ways they could monetize these other uses. And they've spoken about offering you know, broadband service or uh, uh, some sort of pay services, uh, sending updates to autonomous uh, to, to, uh, to autonomous vehicles, other things like that that they can use for it. And, or they could lease it out to other parties that, wanna, that are in need of spectrum. So there's a lot of uh, financial incentive for them to use it. And, and, and largely that use won't be governed by existing rules that are, are, are supposed to cover you know, for, you know, using it for the, for the public good. And so that's the attractiveness. And so to the extent that you know, in order to get that they have to disenfranchise some customers out there. That may be a trade that they're willing to make. And that's what I think a lot of people want to make sure is, if we're going to give you this, you have to make sure that you abide by some protections not to disenfranchise <coughs> existing customers or cable operators or others that are part of this ecosystem. Yeah, it's always the disenfranchisement that's the most concerning. And the effects are not evenly distributed, and the people who get left behind are predominantly low-income households, people who sell the wire antennas on their TV sets. And I think that it's easy to underestimate uh, the percentage or number of households that have those outdated TV sets that will have to be replaced. I think it's something like one-fifth of households have at least one TV that will have to be replaced as a part of this proposed transition. And I think it's important to think through those costs and to make sure that a huge segment of the population is not left behind. And there are means to accommodate those predominantly lower income households. And as I mentioned before, uh, some of these cash trap localities and municipalities. I think it's also worth noting that we're talking about uh, broadcasters who traditionally had sort of a public interest obligation. Get the spectrum for free, or so you have all these rules that you have to abide by you know, in exchange for that. Um, and we're taking broadcasters and we're introducing them to new markets so they're comp competing in markets where they traditionally have not been. And with that comes every incentive to, um, to harm their competitors, truthfully, by driving up the cost of their, their must-have broadcast content to those that are competing them, perhaps on a mobile platform or some other platform that we have yet, that has yet to be determined. Um, and with the, the public interest obligation of getting that spectrum for free, I think that it's, it's worth having a discussion about how um, that spectrum is used and what are the conditions that surround it. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Joe. I, 
when, you know, as I'm hearing about these, you know, new fee-based services over the television airwaves, which is, you know, fine, I may, I may actually, you know, buy some of those sports highlight clips uh, from CBS or, 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 or someone, but, um, but then it raises, you know, this, this other question. So, you know, this debate around a next-gen TV transition has focused mostly on innovation on the one hand, you know, product innovation versus costs, and, you know, who, who bears the cost on what schedule. But what about the public interest obligations, which um, are, are many? Um, are those still relevant, and will they apply to next-gen TV as they do to today to DTV? I mean, John, you, Consumers Union has right. historically yeah, we, been an advocate for right. public we, interest, right? Yes, we have, and we made it very clear in our comments that those public interest obligations should apply to the 3.0 signal. And the draft order appears to say that and do that. We will hope that remains to be the case in, um, come next Thursday. Um, but yeah, children educational programming, emergency alerts, local, uh, local um, programming, local news. Those basic public interest obligations that Joe pointed out, they got the spectrum for free. Um, sometimes they don't like to be reminded of that, but that's the trade-off, that's the compact. And so we think 1.0, 3.0, it should apply moving forward to both signals. Um, mm -hmm. You can leave it at that. Anything else on that? Or, you know, okay. All right, so I'd like to uh, hit these word drill. It sounds a little dental, but drill down a, 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 a bit uh, on the simulcasting, which came up at the beginning because I think particularly for over the air viewers, and, and actually, you know, Jill and Mike and Ross in particular should remind us if this has collateral impact on pay TV viewers who are, as John said in the beginning, you know, we got about 15% watching over the air and 85% still paying for TV, roughly. So with simulcasting, um, it's a relief that local stations cannot uh, pull the plug on their, DTV, on their current DTV signal for at least five years. But the draft order um, also has I guess what I earlier called some p potential loopholes uh, that Mike uh, dis you know, mentioned uh, at the outset. So the first one <coughs> I just want to ask about is, um, well, actually, kind of as a clarification, first is the simulcast requirement itself is five years. That's the headline number? No, no. But it's, it's a five-year simulcast requirement? No, no. So so but similar. Yeah, so this, the... <laughs> The simulcast requirement lasts until the FCC has a further proceeding to, to determine that it's no longer required. Uh, the, the substantial similarity requirement, which is what gives meaning to a simulcast requirement, goes away in five years. And, and, if, okay. and if you ask me to explain why that might be, I, I cannot offer you an explanation. So. Yeah, okay, okay, so we, well, there, we don't know real, why that is, so what's the implication well, of that? There's a real danger of it. I mean, we talk about market incentives and flexibility to the broadcasters. Um, that cuts both ways. You have a market incentive to shift consumers from 1.0 to 3.0. After five years, as Mike points out, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be substantially similar. So what do you start moving over to 3.0? NFL football? Boy, oh boy, well, yeah, I'm sorry, that's on the 3.0 signal. Um, the Oscars, that's on the 3.0 signal. What happens there? We don't know. It remains to be determined. But there's a market incentive to drive consumers to 3.0, and that, that right there, I mean, you are sit there like, well, I can buy a new TV. Um, cable's getting put over a barrel, but I guess I could get a cable subscription. Um, that's going to cost me money. But that's the real pickle some consumers might find themselves in. So that would be almost, in effect, a flash cut moment at the end of the five years, depending on what the broadcasters right. pull off the primary stream. But I like how Mike described it. I mean, you can have the simulcast requirement indefinite, and there's a new rulemaking to see when you cut off the 1.0 signal, like the analog to digital transition. Mm -hmm. But without a substantial similar test in there, it has no teeth. And is that, um, so for five years, the content on the current DTV channel has to be 
substantially similar. Uh, um, but is that five years from when ATS C3.0 is available to everybody, or is it the, the, uh, the five years from now? The effective date. Because when is ATS C3.0 going to be deployed? When is it going to be um, available on most network affiliates? They're doing a pilot project, I think, North Carolina and Cleveland, off the top of my head. Um, whether or not they do it, uh, some people say 2019. Some broadcasters are going to be more aggressive in rolling out ATS C3.0 than others. I mean, Sinclair, Nexstar, Univision seem to be um, um, very much pro ATSC. So um, they own a whole lot of stations. So we might see uh, at, at least one test uh, um, sooner rather than later uh, in each of these markets on each of their stations. There may be other broadcasters, like I said, that, that don't believe in ATSC at all. And ATSC 3.0 may never want to launch it or may be the last to launch it. And, and, and they're under no obligation to actually make that transition. It could be three to five years. And yeah. maybe it's, it's highly likely that your smaller rural independent broadcasters are going to be the last if it ever actually gets there. It's hmm. going to be a while. Okay. And I, sh I should mention that when our groups, uh, OTI with Consumers Union and Public Knowledge, when we, you know, we've been going into the commission the last few days and we've been telling the media advisors that we would like um, to see, you know, no sunset on the substantially similar, but simply the FCC to promise that within five years they'll do another rulemaking because by then they'll have experience. You know, we'll see what, what are these services, what is the consumer demand, what is the take up, and they can just decide at that point, but who knows. Um, and then coverage, um, it was mentioned that, you know, if a, if a station these stations, when part of channel sharing is they may be moving their 1.0, their current DTV um, transmission from one tower to another, which may cause losing s some of the viewers in a, uh, in a local market to lose access to that local station. They, you know, they it simply would become too far away to see potentially. The commission seems to be allowing them to um, uh, to sort of um, lose up to 5% of the viewers. Um, and above that level, they'll lose the um, expedited processing. Um, but, I mean, should that be, is that the right, uh, the right way to handle this? I mean, I don't know, John, are you, Mike, you go first? or no, are any of you concerned look, about? Again, we've said that, and again, we understand that the 5% number came from some stuff that that happened in the past under some different circumstances. We think in light of the, the efforts that the broadcasters have been making in, in terms of uh, you know, being reimbursed for the, the auction-related repack expenses, and 5% and, and, you know, is a pretty big number to get expedited processing, particularly if the expedited processing is 15 days after public notice goes on. I mean, I think the, the important thing here is that A, expedited processing should be limited to some smaller subset of, of, of circumstances that are truly not problematic, and B, that whether expedited, expedited or not, uh, that the processing ought to allow folks to understand what's happening to them, right? It, it, there ought to be, you know, maps, for example, so everybody can know, I, I got a signal today, I don't get a signal tomorrow, uh, and without hiring a spectrum engineer, and ought to have some opportunity to comment. I mean, I, I think that, you know, look, uh, ATVA has said that if, if shot clocks are appropriate, such that, uh, uh, that, that the ap non-expedited applications don't get lost in the Media Bureau, you know, we have no real objection to that. The point is, is there enough in the application that everybody knows what's happening um, and for the public to comment? And, 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 it, and again, if, if you're going to have 5% of the population losing service, that seems like something that merits more than 15 days uh, uh, consideration. I was just going to, yeah, because what I should have just said, asked more bluntly, is what if 20% of the community is, is losing their signal? Well, there, there, Does that just mean just they have to, to make, wait an extra just, few weeks for just to approval? Make it clear, yeah, that's, 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 that's the, the, the kind of obvious point I wanted to make, Michael. First of all, just acknowledging 5%. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the obvious No, that's okay. Just knew it. <laughs> but no, the, the, the fact that there is this even 5% requirement acknowledges some consumers might lose their over their signal. That's the obvious. Like, it, it's right there. Like, you might lose your signal. 
Above and beyond that, there's nothing preventing you from applying. It could be 20%. You can still apply for a simulcast arrangement, um, but you have to sweeten the pot. Like, um, I think the, in the draft order, they said, well, do you, are you going to offer consumers dongles, which is like the HDMI fix and how you can magically get the 3.0 signal, set top boxes, some kind of fix. And if you do that, then we might, might approve your application. So when we went into the commission, we said, well, why don't you, if you're already suggesting that, you can, make, you can perhaps make that a requirement. And above 5%, we're going to get into legal weeds here, make it a rebuttable presumption that you don't get it approved. You can come back and give us a ar good argument as why you should get approved, but unless, until you do that, you will not be approved. And, and I also point out, remember in rural areas, our members report that our, um, 23 percent of our members say 90 percent or more of their subscribers cannot currently receive an over-the-air broadcast signal and two-thirds at 66 percent I think uh, say at least 10 percent of their subscribers cannot receive an over-the-air broadcast signal like today so we take another 5 percent 12 percent 15 percent whatever it is you're really dramatically impacting these subscribers yeah just from the draft order So yeah, no, the 5% yeah, of, fact, right. No, and that could be the, that may, maybe that will end up being the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but the, the, I think the 5% refers to uh, the current DTV. The simulcast. The simulcast. Yeah, the simulcast. Yeah. The current right, the simulcast, DTV. That, but, that's, but that's not what the broadcasters have asked for. They've asked for the flexibility to be able to. Well, that's what we're concerned about. That's what we're concerned about. And it will come. 5% is millions of people. I mean, there's 100 million plus homes. 5% across the board is millions and millions of people that will no longer be able to, that may have, that, that this Christmas may buy an HDTV. One, you know, ATSC 1.0 television, and they find themselves three months later unable to receive anything over that television. And the only signal they may end up getting is a 3.0 signal. And so what do they do? Oh, great, let me go out and buy some ATSC 3.0 equipment. Well, guess what? There's not even a standard available in order to buy an equipment to, to down convert a 3.0 signal to a 1.0 signal. The equipment's yeah. not even available on the marketplace, yet the broadcasters in a few months are going after this order is approved, are going to be able to transition to the 3.0, disenfranchise right. a whole bunch. Right. Right. signal so no right. one can receive. That makes great business sense. You're not right. in reality here, folks. All right, Mike, Mike, bring, yeah, I'm be sorry. good if you could bring this up all at once at, at you know, in about five or five or so minutes. Well, but the, the, the bottom line is, the, the, is that the order could do a better job protecting consumers. The fact that there's only a 15-day uh, window for people to comment on millions of people potentially losing the service is just too short. It, that's not an opportunity for people to weigh in uh, and comment on. Um, and so, so look, if, if you're going to have an expedited process, let's not make it a, a joke. Let's make it actually something that people can come in. Make it 45 days. Make it something that's actually reasonable. It doesn't have to stand in the way of broadcasters doing what they want to do, but let's give the opportunity if there's going to be a cable operator that's going to lose the over-the-air service and it's going to impact people, if their consumers are going to lose service, impact them, let them have a say. And I don't think, I think it's important to remember that nobody's opposed to the new standard for the broadcasters. Nobody is saying it should not happen. I think it's about doing it in a way that makes sense in a, a reasonable process that protects both the consumers and those parties that have to work with the broadcasters and to be frank have not had a good experience in working with the broadcasters in the past. So none of us are here saying this should not happen. It's just doing it in a way, in a process that makes more sense that's protecting the people that need to be protected. So speaking of process, I'd like to return to at least one more issue you know, before we open it up, which is um, retransmission consent. So I think um, you know, Ross mentioned, which was a number, a staggering number, 179 blackouts already this year. Um, so these retransmission consent negotiations today concern the current TV 
uh, DTV 1.0. So what's the connection? I, I don't know if anybody's yet really made it clear. What is the connection between 3.0, between next gen TV and these retransmission consent fees? Because they seem to be too, I thought retransmission 3.0 is voluntary and something that's going to be running in parallel, at least for five years, separately from uh, from 1.0. Look, look, I think the, as Ross pointed out, and I'll just, you know, uh, repeat what he said, the concern is that, that the broadcaster goes to the MVPD and says, I will not talk to you about renewing your 1.0 agreement unless you agree to carry 3.0, right? And that, that A, that doesn't sound terribly voluntary, right? And, and, and B, look, um, um, the right way to sort of figure out if there's a market for 3.0 is to have separate negotiations for first-time carriage of 3.0. That way a broadcaster <coughs> says, hey, I've got this great thing, and it's got a great picture, and let me tell you about it. It's got great sound, and let me tell you about it. And, and the MVPD can think to itself, boy, that sounds pretty good, and that's probably worth buying the equipment, because maybe I can distinguish myself from other MVPDs, or I could retain subs, or I can get new subs, and then we can kind of agree on the appropriate compensation for that, right? Uh, that is a very different set of circumstances than the broadcaster saying, you know, hey, the NFL playoffs start tomorrow. Um, uh, if you would like to carry them, uh, here's what you're going to do, right? And, and, and uh, you know, the market experience has been closer to the latter than the former. And so I think that that is why MVPDs are concerned. And, and you know, the, the, I will say that ATVA suggested a, a a, a structural fix, again, which is uh, you know, separate negotiations for the first time carriage, precisely to avoid having the commission be the referee between, uh, uh, between MVPDs and broadcasters. Uh, but uh, um, uh, so that's, what, that's the way we think that, 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 that these negotiations ought to work. And that's the, it's both the, mo both the most voluntary and the closest to an actual marketplace negotiation. And when we came out in the same place as well, saying that the, the two negotiations should be separate, um, when you're, you have to carry broadcast content to have a viable MVBD product. You just do. You're not going to be able to sell the service to subscribers unless you're offering the, the local news, weather, and the broadcast uh, you know, entertainment content and sports. But um, the broadcasters know this, and it's been most, at least the small carriers' experience, that in order to obtain that must-have content, there are all these other things you have to have. And here's the price, by the way, which you'll pay for it. So the, there's a very real fear, and I think it's a very realistic fear, that the broadcasters have every incentive and will force the uh, MVPDs to carry 3.0 to get the 1.0. So it makes sense mm -hmm. to separate them, and let's really let the market uh, forces determine whether or not the 3.0 is carried. And let me just add, I, I, I think I said it, but I want to make sure that I said it, that our proposal at least would require separate negotiations for the first time carriage. You know, once it's sort of carried, then, then people can kind of talk about whatever they want. It's really meant to govern only first time carriage for folks who haven't carried it yet. Yeah, yeah, and this is, um, I assume in policy speak, right, this is, we were, we were really talking about the good faith bargaining rule that the commission already is supposed to be enforcing, and you're talking about this being a per se violation I, if, we, if they try to do this we, without, without, unless it's separated? I mean, the, the lawyers can kind of argue about it, but we think that the commission has authority to do this either under 325 or simply under its more broad legal authority to adopt the standard in the first place. You can adopt the standard. A condition get, on the and standard. condition it how you, how you want. So it doesn't have to show up in section 325. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one last uh, question for me, which probably doesn't concern uh, <coughs> many of you, but it is, it is definitely uh, an ax to grind for us. I know in, in our comments, um, uh, with, again, as I mentioned, with, with Consumers Union and, and, you know, and public knowledge, we, you know, we had flagged the, um, in, in fact, I guess initially in our, our comments and reply comments on the, Brug, on the NAB's petition and so on, that we were certainly happy to see that, that this could be an on-channel transition. You may recall the last, trans, the last the DTV transition from analog to digital, Congress gave uh, broadcasters um, uh, the use of a second channel of spectrum for 10 years. 
uh, what Senator McCain called the Great Airwaves robbery. Um, but that was just uh, a loan. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and at that time, there was actually not much else going, you know, happening on those, uh, on those uh, channels uh, except wireless microphones in some, in some areas. Uh, so, you know, when the petition came out a year ago, we were certainly happy to see that they, they said categorically that this was an on-channel transition. Um, and just uh, on October 27th, just two weeks ago, the NAB put out a statement that says, notably, a transition to next-gen TV requires broadcasters to use no additional spectrum. And yet in filings, you know, we've noted that some broadcasters are saying that they'd like to use the vacant uh, TV channels, which are now allocated for unlicensed use, the so-called TV white spaces, because that would supposedly, you know, facilitate this. It would actually just give them more space for 3.0. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I'll ask John because he's the one who's had a horse in, in, well, you know, you're more in this spectrum, a little bit. You're more the spectrum expert than I am. Um, I just think in that case, I, mean, I can see why they would. Why not ask for? Right? Even though they've made the claims that they, they can do this on channel, they don't need additional spectrum. I think, if, correct me if I'm wrong, they punt that to a future rulemaking or a future NPRM um, to see whether or not these vacant channels can be used as part of the transition. But I think you might be better to answer that than I would be, Michael. Yeah. Well, we just, we just said the worst case, right. it can be part of the next rulemaking about the actual transition, since this is supposed to be just a voluntary component. Um, but, of course, we'd prefer that they would just deny that for now because, unfortunately, uh, one of the things that's hobbled uh, the use of, of vacant TV channels for rural broadband, and we still have, you know, over 30 million people in the country without broadband, mostly in rural areas, <coughs> 23 million in rural areas. Um, one of the things that hobbles that is there's been tremendous uncertainty um, about whether there'll be a sufficient number of uh, TV channels available for unlicensed use nationwide, which has the ripple effect of making, uh, of, of causing the uh, uh, chip makers, uh, Broadcom, MediaTek, for example, to go into the FCC and say, we, won't, we can't invest to integrate this into a Wi-Fi chipset unless we know it's going to work everywhere. And so equipment for broadband is much more expensive. So. There's just been five years of uncertainty about unlicensed access to vacant TV channels due to the incentive auction. And this would just, even, even kicking this to the FNPRM would just extend that uncertainty that dampens um, the ability of, of you know, rural, rural wireless providers and others uh, to, uh, to adopt uh, white space technology and drive the cost of equipment down the cost curve. So. I'll make myself a panelist for that one issue. <laughs> um, you want, you want this chair? Yeah. <laughs> and I won't rant on, but uh, you know, Jim here and others know that it's a, you know, that's been an important issue, uh, you know, here at New America. So actually, Jim Snyder. Um, but My question is, um, it seems like everybody gives lip service to preserving free TV, but as I read the report and order, uh, or the rulemaking and the FCC's um, enforcement history, it creates perverse incentives to hinder free TV, to severely damage it. Now, I'll give you just two sort of e examples. One was with the first transition. It cost a lot of money to broadcast over the air, and the stations cut corners, so maybe it cost 100000 I didn't think it was that much at the time to cover an area, but when nobody has the receivers, the broadcasters thought it was too much, so they didn't actually do what they were required to do, and the FCC is terrible at enforcing laws when it comes to broadcasters. So if they don't want to cover all of them because the energy bill is higher than the usage, they don't do it. So that's one type of issue, an enforcement issue, where uh, I think they might underprovide um, over-the-air coverage because with must carry they're getting huge coverage and that's where the money is so they're gonna focus on the must carry the retransmission and underplay 
And then the second element is just the sheer marketplace incentives, where you have this mixed good, where they can charge or not charge. They're naturally talking about you know, incentives in the consumer's interest. They're going to figure out a way to put more and more of the valuable services on the pay side. And this really accelerates the abil broadcaster ability to charge for, for information and screw the free TV viewers. And I just haven't seen that. All these perverse incentives built into it has not been part of the discussion. And to what extent do you agree that part of it is an enforcement problem? So it's the, you, we give them lip service to these things, but then we don't enforce them. And the second is the marketplace incentives they create are so overwhelming to screw over time the free TV viewers. How do you see that playing out? Well, I will agree uh, at the outset, yeah, there are some, when I, when I see market incentives and flexibility, both in the, in the broadcaster's comments and then in the draft order, what exactly does that mean? Um, and is it to migrate from 1.0 to 3.0? I share your concern about over the air. I think just by, as I mentioned earlier, just by the very admission in the draft order, you can lose up to 5%. And even if you lose up to you know, more than that, you can still apply to simulcast. Um, so we are concerned about that. Uh, moving forward, but to someone else's point, yeah, if 3.0 is out there and developed, it does, it is a better signal. It does go into buildings better, it goes further. So we, we want to hope for the best on that front, but I agree. Uh, on the enforcement, um, yes, I share your concern. Anyone else on that one? Or we don't I, I, I just agree. I mean, I mean the, the, there are, they're, they're, they're rational business actors, right? They're going to go where the money is, and 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 to the extent that they are given the the, the FCC in the order seems to recognize. Oh well, the contour may not be exactly the same as before. Oh, you know, let's not require them to go continue offering their signal in HD. Let's give them the flexibility to also down convert into SD. Um, let's allow them to do flash cuts uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, let's sunset the simulcasting uh, obligations. And so, you know, those are all areas where there can be consumer harm, where broadcasters have flexibility to maximize other types of business revenue with the advent of ATSC 3.0. And I, I think at the end of the day, that's where we're, the concern is. The, the FCC, I will say, hasn't completely ignored many of these issues, but what they have done is they just haven't done enough to ensure that consumers are not going to be disenfranchised as a result of this transition. Yeah, and, and there's clearly this, this trade-off between public and, you know, the traditional public interest obligations, starting with offering a free over-the-air signal versus, you know, this kind of idea of, of, of innovation and new services, whether they're fee-based or not. And, Commissioner Rosenworcel said, gee, ideally that's a question for Congress, you know, are, do we care less about those uh, traditional public interest obligations, but uh, unfortunately um, Congress doesn't seem to move fast enough to, uh, um, you know, to handle a question like this, or at least hasn't yet on this one. But who knows, maybe as this starts to become a reality for consumers, Congress will become aware. Um, other questions? Yes. <laughs> Tell us who you are. And I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a microphone. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lifelong broadcaster. <laughs> okay. I started when I was 15. Okay. Michael, you're one of the smartest people in the room, and I think most people in the room know that. So I really respect what you say and think. And one thing, and I, I made so many notes here, but one, the one thing that really popped out in this panel is your observation, or I, I believe what you suggested was that broadcasters should not be given a transition channel or relief when transition channels may be available to ease the deployment of ATSC 3.0. And that, that just, that, that sends my brain into a pretzel of trying to figure out how you square, how you rationalize everything that's going on and what I really what I really draw out of that I mean right because most of the problems that have been discussed on this panel whether you believe they're valid or not and I, I was very involved in trying to figure out how you do this how you transition and 
I promise, because I was in the room, none of the, none of the sort of consumer harms, those were, nobody talked about that stuff as like, let's do it this way so we can do that to consumers. It all comes out of the fact there's no transition channel. How many people on the panel oppose the incentive auction on the grounds that there would no longer be possible to allow broadcasters to innovate while spending their own money to broadcast in two standards at the same time without diminishing coverage, right? That's the trade-off. We don't have transition channels anymore. Michael, you don't even like transition channels, but you don't like the compromises that are made to get from point A to point B to allow innovation to go out to the people that don't want to sign up for pay TV. So I, I, this is a serious question, because what we're balancing here is some people advocate more spectrum for unlicensed. I like, I like unlicensed okay, a lot. I think it's important. A lot of people want more spectrum for, uh, to be auctioned for a variety of reasons, and other people want free TV. I suspect that what's going on in the background here is a lot of people really don't like free TV, or they don't think it's very important anymore, or if they could make a choice, they would take the broadcast spectrum and allocate it to unlicensed. I'm not saying, you, look, this is, this is an opinion, everybody's entitled to one. But I, my take, Michael, is that, you're, that you would advocate diminishing broadcast and, and accepting some of these compromises in the transition in order to provide more, un more spectrum for unlicensed. I also take it that most people on the panel see it the same way. And if, and if, and if that's the analysis, you know, I, I think the honest policy path is to step out front and say that. And if it's not, then I think we need to go back. And I wonder if anybody on the panel would support if spectrum were available, granting every broadcaster a second channel and requiring them to broadcast on it spending twice the cost for this period of time during the transition in order to address these issues. Would you guys make Spectrum available so that the transition could be more orderly as the last one? That's my, and, and, and would anybody actually think it'd be a better use of public resources to push broadcasting away, eliminate the access to free over the air TV in favor of unlicensed? So the just to questions. clarify, make sure you understand, you're saying that doing this making stations work together and doing this by channel sharing, in other words, where say two stations combine their 1.0 here and their 3.0 there, that it, it would just be much more, be much more efficient if each station had two channels. Well, it's a compromise, right? I mean, I worked on this. I sat in the room. How do you do this? You look at single station markets, right? Mm -hmm. You look at two station markets. How do you take all those channels and squeeze them down? You can't do them in HD, right? You, 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 you can't. Broadcaster, it's, it's not taking away HD, Ross. There's no requirement for HD today, and broadcasters do it anyway. Right. Well, let's, let's get the, because I know there's a let's, people but let's have get questions, the, let's, too. So. I, I, so I'm just sorry, interested, would, would everybody here agree <laughs> that broadcasters should be given a second channel in order to eliminate a lot of these problems? Yeah, yeah. So, so John, we've known each other, and you're a very bright lawyer, but I, you're wrong on so many points. I would just I, They're say, just questions. These I are questions. The one, right, point right, that the, question. the one point that you're right is, yes, there is no additional channel, and, they have, and there are some things that, uh, there are some compromises that have to be made under the circumstances to allow for channel sharing. Fine. The question then becomes where you make those cuts in terms of balancing consumer harm with allowing the transition. And the decisions that the order has made has said 5% of consumers can get harmed and there's expedited uh, processing. We can go from HD to SD. We can allow for flash cuts and we could allow for no longer simulcasting at the end for after five years. Every one of those decisions could be made reverse, ensure better protection from consumers, and if the situations that arise that impact the ability of a broadcaster to transition, seek a waiver. And then you can get your, nobody's out to stop the broadcasters from making their transition to ATSC. This is the paranoia that the broadcasters have that everybody's against them. It's not the case. Do your transition. Let's just have rules that protect consumers first. Okay, I, I'm not going to. I vote for you. 
And I would so I, I'm wondering if anybody else thinks broadcasters should be given a second channel. That's actually the question. If it were, it's not available, but wouldn't that solve a lot of these problems? And then the converse of that is, aren't a lot of these problems the fallout of there not being a second channel, which is a fallout of the incentive auction? And I didn't remember anybody popping up and saying, well, we shouldn't have this incentive auction because then broadcaster is stuck with MPEG-2 and ATSB in like perpetuity. Perhaps the entire transition. What, 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 Mike, when we get to the It's all couched within the region. Mike, let, it's all couched let me call on you next. Uh, um, okay, so it so sounds I not, a, although I have I, two I, serious questions. I should pending. just mention, yeah, right. that and in our, in the ex parte, for example, we, you know, we just filed, we also mentioned that, you know, consumers benefit from unlicensed, mm -hmm. so there, there's a trade off there, even in terms of the consumer scale. Uh, on either side, and also, the, you know, the simple fact that it came up earlier at some point that a big part of the purpose of 3.0 is to compete with the mobile industry on sending video to, you know, mobile devices. The, the cellular industry is doing it with Spectrum. On Spectrum, they paid about $50 billion for, and the broadcasters have paid nothing. So, um, so it's a question of whether you deserve free Spectrum to compete with an industry that bought Spectrum. And I, I think you'll find disagreement on that, perhaps even, you know, at the FCC. So, so it is a lot of trade-offs. I understand. But let's get Mike Gravino in. Over the last, on, years. you need a microphone though. But you don't do may not do need we? one, but Thank for the webcast. And over, over the last 14 years, my partners and I have dumped millions of dollars into the licenses and low power that we have. We got it for free, but we've served the public. We've invested into services for the public. And it's just like somebody homesteading land years ago. We have the right, uh, the expectation of renewal on our licenses as long as we fulfill our EAS obligations and programming obligations to the government and keep broadcasting to our contours. So while we may have obtained it for free in filing fees, we've certainly invested into it for the public service. Um, I think you misspoke when you talked about white space. There is no allocation for TV white space. You are an opportunistic s a service. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, right. So whether a temp Second channel minute. is used or not, too bad. You're down and uh, you're unlicensed. The licensed, providers, licensed service providers have an obligation to keep providing that service. And if the FCC mm -hmm. says you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Um, that's I, 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 that's in, my in, main question. Help you, oh, okay, go ahead. I have an actual question. Yeah. You want to comment? Yeah, uh, to Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Uh, I, at the beginning of this thing, uh, Mr. Calabrese said that there was some play in issues involving retrans and uh, I think uh, simulcasting at the FCC, he felt. And I was wondering if you guys all agree with that. Do you think the FCC majority is open to listening to some of what you're saying here? Uh, you know, you've got the minority seems to be behind you, but uh, do you think uh, Chairman Pike or that this order is going to change at all to incorporate any of these policies you're suggesting? between now and next week. I, mean, look, I, I hope so, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? We, we, we we, you said you've been in there. I mean, have you gotten any kind of sense from them or anything? I, I think that they're, they're, they are considering. I think, I think people are listening. I think uh, they, they are taking the arguments that we've made seriously. Uh, and and, and we'll, we'll just have to see. I, I, don't, I don't know that I could say beyond that. Oh, and then I would say that when something is drafted, it's much harder to get it changed. That's a good point. And then a quick follow-up. Uh, uh, you guys sound like you agree with a lot of what uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel said, but she also said that uh, Congress should be uh, taking this thing up. I don't think any of you mentioned that. Do you agree with her three-point plan for reforming this thing? Well, it's not the reality we have right now, though. I mean, right now we're working at something that is moving at the FCC. Right. The question is, as you watch the transition move forward over the next, let's say, five years um, with this with the simulcasting, um, will Congress need to get involved? How will it go? I mean, looking at it with the most positive lens, I want it to work out. And to your earlier question, I think in our, in our meetings with the Commission, I thought, um, and to John's point as well, there is a sensitivity, um, at least I sense it, maybe I'm being too positive, to consumers losing their signals. I, I felt there was some thinking going on, like, well, yeah, maybe Maybe that 5% number, or maybe we should have a rebuttable presumption. Maybe we should require broadcasters to allow a fix in the form of a dongle when that, when that if, if and when it becomes available and it works. Maybe that's cheaper than broadcasting on two channels. 
Um, but I, I, did, I did sense there, to your point, there wasn't an active malicious feeling to really stick it to consumers. I didn't sense that, and I don't get it. And, and in our comments, we very, I think we tried to take a balanced tone of saying we admit or we can see that there are a lot of great things that this 3.0 single can do. We don't oppose the broadcasters from moving to 3.0. Um, it's just how do you mitigate it? How do you, how do you balance it so you mitigate harm to consumers where you identify real harm to consumers? And it's hard because it's not, de it's not deployed yet. So a lot of it is we are engaging in hypotheticals. So. And, and let's be honest, I mean, the FCC has a difficult job. You've got different competing interests here. And we're all representing someone who has a, a particular goal and a particular position. And it's the FCC that has to weigh it all out and figure out where we're going to end up. Todd? Hi, Todd Shields with Bloomberg News. Uh, what, what should we think about privacy implications of this uh, proposed new service? I will just say, to, to my immediate response to the question is, I'm surprised the draft order didn't even address it at all. Um, I think if you even word search it, privacy doesn't even come up. Um, and it's dismaying to, to Michael and I in particular because in our reply comments, we put it in there. It's like the, the commission should look at this. Um, maybe they need more information, maybe we need more facts, but if everything we're believing from Gordon Smith at the NAB show, um, and I'm, again, not opposed to it, but they're saying directed advertising, and Sinclair talks about being able to have, to see what their consumers are watching, and, and being able to target advertising, that's all well and good, but the commission should look at what are the privacy implications of that when broadcasters have the ability to have a richer picture of what their consumers are viewing and watching, much in the same way that cable is regulated by 631. We simply ask the question, should 631 apply to broadcasters if and when 3.0 is being delivered and they're engaging in this sort of targeted advertising and uh, creating consumer profiles? Um, but 631 is? That is, that's in the Of community. the act. Yeah, of the act. Which, uh, the, the portion that regulates cable. It regulates cable with regards to protection of uh, consumer data. And you probably, I mean, t John, I'll give you this. It, it may have pr this may have prompted <laughs> the question, but just to make sure we know, or for the audience, that uh, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell yesterday sent a letter to Chairman Pai saying, why does this order, why does this order not even mention privacy, that um, targeted advertising is, is one of the, you know, incentives for 3.0, which obviously is going to involve, you know, um, collecting data on, on viewers and, it's all part of the interactive nature of it. Um, Jim? Oh, uh, yeah, we're going to have to wrap up in a minute, but go ahead. Question here, and then um, a comments, and then a question related to that. Um, the questioner asked, why don't we add an extra channel for the transition? And I would, the question, the phrasing of that, I would say that broadcasters are already getting uh, three to four channels as part of the transition. And what he's proposing would be to give them as many as eight channels to manage this transition. So how do I uh, come to that conclusion? We originally thought of a channel in a different way. In the NTSC world, we thought of it as providing one TV channel. That was the common sense definition of a channel. And then we segued into this notion of a channel is a certain amount of spectrum that can provide many of the old fashioned channels. So in England, they took the old fashioned one, and they did their digital transition, and they said, okay, we have so many new channels we can provide in the old channel, we're going to take half of it for our digital dividend and auction it. That was taboo in the United States. We had to give it all those new channels to the incumbent broadcasters. But the question here, so they did it, we couldn't even have that discussion, is the most interesting questions are always the ones that aren't asked because they're off the table for taboo political reasons. Why were you unable? Because you're you know, going from ultra high to high definition to ultra high definition TV requires at least four times the number of bits, because it's more than four times the resolution, plus a lot of other things. Why couldn't we had this discussion? Why is it so much off the table, what they were able to discuss in Britain? Why couldn't we do that in the United States? I mean, I think it's clear that politics are impossible in the United States to raise that question. But I'm still going to ask you, it's a common sense thing. We're giving them four channels for the existing one. Why couldn't we just double their number of channels and take in two back for ourselves like they did? Why is that impossible to have that discussion in the United States? You'd be just laughed if you propose it. But there's a technical answer to that. They manage their infrastructure differently in the UK model. Well, I think that's a good answer. I don't want to go into the board of that. Okay. 
So any any last because we're over time, and I'm sure the pan yeah, go. individual <laughs> panelists will be willing to have a sidebar. But um, any last uh, comment or we covered an awful lot of ground. I wish we could have gone into the privacy more. But in any event, all right. Well, join me in thanking uh, the panel. This was a great discussion. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rob. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> Please be sure if you if you don't normally get our event invitations, you know, sign up over there. Thank you. Or on our homepage. <laughs>